Jenkins. Okay, I'm going to share my screen now. And here we go. I hope everyone can see my screen. Okay. So, um, welcome to the third online Rust and Tell. We usually hold this meetup in person at some random startup co working space in Berlin. But since the pandemic, we moved it to Zoom. This has the advantage that we have a few more speakers which can't be in Berlin. I think this is quite nice. And also, people can watch us all over the internet and right now also via a live stream on YouTube. My name is Bastian Gruber. I'm a Rust developer for the past year, um, working on exchanges, finance institutions in Rust. And um, my co-host is Ryan Levick. He has bad internet connection, so I'm not sure if he's on the meetup right now. But Ryan is, um, yeah, a huge Rust advocate at Microsoft. Um, you can find him at Ryan Levick, Ryan underscore Levick on Twitter. So if you have any Rust related question, feel free to get in touch with him. So the meetup is all about sharing our struggles with the language is not so new anymore. But um, the idea of the meetup is to show behind the developer or the software engineer or the, um, or the product. It always helps to not, to, um, not to just see a polished GitHub um, project with 5,000 5, stars. It helps to see the developer struggle it helps to blow some steam off at the meetup complain about the language but all have a friendly get together once a month um, to share our experiences with the language so and um, this being said it's um, we welcome every super beginner in like into the language even if you haven't programmed much trust yet it can be two lines Feel free to talk about it and your experiences and how you moved from a different language to Rust and what you think about it now. Um, even if we are online, um, we follow the Berlin Code of Conduct. Um, so please, um, you can have, have a look at berlincodeofconduct.org. If you find anything which is not to your liking, feel free to contact us privately. You can send us a meetup message if you, yeah, if like if something bad is happening, please let us know and we will take care of it. Um, since we are online, um, we have a bit of a different setup for the Rust Intel meetup. We are using um, Zoom and a Zoom chat. So if you have any questions um, to the speaker, um, you can type it during the talk and I will go over the questions in the chats um, and um, ask the speaker in the end of his talk or her talk or their talk or um, we will have Zoom breakout rooms. Today we have four talks, four speakers. Um, so I guess we will have a breakout room after the second talk. We will have a five, 10 minute chat, maybe 15 minute chat and then we will go on to the um, to the last two speakers. We had in the past that people wanted more time in their breakout rooms. It's kind of hard since everyone is on their own schedule. So please um, feel free to create your own Zoom rooms or matrix chats at the end of the meetup and then hang out and chat there. Um, this meetup is also streamed live on YouTube. So if you have any questions or if you show your face during the talks, be aware that it will be live streamed. And since we are not just in Berlin, for um, wherever you're currently sitting, we want you. And if we say you, we really mean you. This meetup just exists because every month we can 
present um, three or four speakers. So the hard work is just on you and not on us. We just provide the setup and you do the talk. So we are happy to help you out in the shape of your talk. If you have any questions, if you have any concerns, if you never talked, if you want to talk more, this meetup is a perfect environment. It's free, people can drop in and out. There are no expectations. So feel free to make this your first meet up where you give a presentation and the talk. And a uh, warm thank you to Jan Eric. Um, he is providing the setup, is handling all the technicalities. We wouldn't have been able to pull this up so quickly in such a uh, professional way. So thank you. Which brings us to our four speakers. Um, we have I won't say the names because I might pronounce it wrong. They don't look so hard, but I won't do it. So I just um, tell you the, the talk topics. The first one is interactions with a diving computer. Um, we have a talk about um, can you run Rust in the browser? The third talk will be after the Zoom breakout room break is embedding Rust in Node.js applications. And the last talk of the day will be Git UI written in Rust. Okay, um, thank you for attending this meetup. I hope you will have a great one and a half hours or two hours time. Um, feel free to ask any questions during the talk. Feel free to text me or Ryan privately if you can answer any questions. Also feel free if you get motivated during the meetup to give a talk, feel free just to approach us directly, tell your name and we will sort it out. And um, yeah, the first speaker can now take over and share the screen and we are ready for diving computers <laughs> with Rust. Thank you, Bastian. Uh, always happy to be here. Um, I'm not sh sharing my screen just yet. I just wanted to do, show you quickly what we're talking about. This is a diving computer. It's quite sizable. And uh, it goes on your wrist. And this is the data cable you use for it, which I'm going to address in a second so that you know how much of an experience this cable is. Um, and uh, so let's get, doesn't remember my settings. So let's get started. So it changes the title of this talk a little, um, using Rust to talk to and uh, about my diving computer. Um, because when I pitched this talk to Ryan, he was like, what's that? So I <laughs> felt like I need to a little bit to explain what this thing does. Um, I'm Florian Geisha. I run a company called uh, Ferris Systems, uh, which is world's largest Rust consultancy. And we do run our own conference um, the Oxidize Conf, which is focused on uh, Rust on Embedded, and it, the CFP for this conference is currently open for the next edition. The next edition is going to be online, and it's going to be in July. Um, but not to bore you with that, what is this thing that I showed you? What is a dive computer? Um, dive computers are actually the currently most crucial security equipment that you can have while diving. Uh, what it does, it constantly tracks your depth and your calculated absorption of nitrogen, because if you put the human body under pressure, it will start absorbing nitrogen. Um, and nitrogen, this <clears throat> nitrogen in the body is actually the cause of diver sickness, because if you depressurize your body too quickly, um, it will start to uh, form air bubbles again, and you don't really want to have that. Oh, and Eric just noticed that I should share my slides. Sorry for that. Too busy checking that this little. Do you see them now? Okay. Um, and um, so your dev computer tracks that using a mathematical model, just calculating your current depth and your um, your probable absorption of nitrogen, and also tracks the release of nitrogen during surface times. So if you dive multiple times after each other, it also tracks how much of that nitrogen has naturally released while you've been at the surface, so that your second dive actually tracks 
um, where it tracks your current body state. Um, so it calculates the, di the time you can spend at death and it checks for a safe ascent speed. So if you have too much nitrogen in your body, it checks how fast you can ascend and if there's any kind of pauses you need to make. So depressurizing, you might have heard the term of a depressurizing chamber. And it provides a tracking function for later pretty often. Um, so before that, you would actually use these kinds of tables where you would go, for example, on the uh, top left, you see you start and you go to a depth of like 70 feet and then there's um, there's a time that you can um, <clears throat> that you can spend at that depth, for example. Um, so um, previously you had to use a pretty um, pretty pessimistic model. So for example, you would say, okay, we're diving to 25 meters. So let's say we're taking like 30 and we're assuming that we're spending five minutes at 30 meters or something like that. So you would write curves like this. And obviously your computer can do a much smoother tracking of that. The tracking of a computer is still very, very conservative um, because uh, something I want to show you quickly. Um, there we go. Um, this is the manual of my dive computer. Um, these are the security uh, notices throughout the manual, and they come in three categories, red, deadly, orange, likely deadly, and yellow, um, can have grave harm. And then it starts with one page of, these are all the warnings that might lead to death, um, which are not at all that bad. It's just um, being underwater, being pressurized, and being um, and breathing air is a, a thing that you should take care about. And um, so a diving computer is still, still uses a very, very conservative model for those reasonings. The saying I heard is um, know your boundaries and then stay very, very clear away from them. Okay. So this is the data I can get on the dive computer. This, for example, is one of my early dives. I'm not diving for that long. Um, and you can see to the left, I had some problems coming down. The purple line is my height in the water. And that's one of the reasons why I started extracting data from my dive computer, just for checking like how, where my dives and all of this. Um, and especially you can see that I had some problems actually keeping height, uh, for example, in the middle of it. And all of this so is quite interesting to see in retrospect. This is one of my later dives. Um, where we actually went down to 30 meters. And what you can see here is that we stayed smooth on the profile of the sea and then slowly went up. And you can see at like 848, something like that, we started making a stop in the middle to depressurize when diving up. So this is what you use a dive computer for in general. Uh, so um, in the operational mode of those computers is also very, very interesting. So on the surface, a dive computer is always in waiting mode. And it provides you a simple configuration interface so it can change a couple of things. For example, some divers use different gas mixtures, especially with less ni nitrogen. So this is interesting for that calculation. And it gives you some uh, timer and warning settings. So for example, it can set a warning for, I don't want to go below 15 meters, and then uh, the computer will go off at that moment and start actually beeping um, because sound travels quite nice underwater. It does not allow you to switch off any kind of safety features. It is, again, really, really conservative. For example, after a dive, it, you cannot switch it off for 24 hours. And it, the only thing it displays is you're not allowed to fly in that time. Why? Same thing. You put yourself under pressure and you should make sure that all the nitrogen can release. And one, one of the most common ways to actually get diver sickness is diving and then going on a plane because a plane is very, very depressurized. That's a, a, a pretty, pretty common cause of accidents, uh, much more common than actually having accidents underwater. And this cannot, can absolutely not be switched off. So the operation of the whole thing is pretty, pretty automatic. Um, yeah, and provides you with all the dive history that you had. And for example, it marks all the dives where, for example, you ascended more quickly than the dive computer recommended you and the dive model recommended you, which can be useful for later on just for checking. Usually it's for checking, oh, hey, I did something wrong on this dive. I should make better the next time. 
and at depth, um, a dive computer switches itself on exactly the moment it touches water. So the whole process is automatic. And then it ticks and mine logs every five seconds or something like that. And then it tracks the depth, the temperature, and the remaining time where theoretically you could go, um, you could ascend without any kind of decompression because you don't have enough nitrogen in your body at all. Uh, not enough nitrogen in your, in your body absorbed yet. This is called uh, zero time diving, zero decompression time, and this is what you usually do. Um, and it saves all those points regu regularly on the computer. And it, on every of those ticks, it will um, calculate the model nitrogen absorption and presents you with the remaining time that you have at the current depth um, and the ascent descent speed that you currently have. Because underwater, it's pretty hard to actually track where you are and how high and low you are, um, except when you have a floor below you. So having a computer um, check that is pretty, pretty interesting. Um, yeah, and it has a separate stop mode. The moment you should actually start stopping, um, we'll say, okay, please remain at this depth. Here's a countdown for you, three minutes, something like that. It's pretty interesting. So here's a data sample that you could get out, uh, get off of this. Um, in there's a common XML format that is, uh, in some ways, cursed but <laughs> really easily readable. So what it tracks is actually quite simple. It just tracks the temperature, the depth. It, it actually locks with each of these um, what uh, um, which kind of device has produced this data sample, and the most important time uh, part. Um, for the dive computer to operate is this deco time. That means at this depth, I can still spend, this is a 28 meter depth, I can still, still spend um, 1,020 seconds uh, before I have to, to decompress um, on the way up. So um, interfacing with the dive computer is also very conservative. It's purely for reading. Dive computers are security equipment. They're not intended to be messed with it. Um, you need to buy a cable for it. And this cable costs six euros for a 200 euro computer. And then at some point you figure out that, it, that one of your biggest connection problems is that it actually doesn't connect properly and you need to wiggle it around, which is really, really annoying if you want to debug something um, because you pretty often lose connection because uh, the cable is properly there. Um, and then trying to figure out what the dive computer actually exposes. And the problem is that's rarely documented and, but there is a library called libdivecomputer, um, which I've been using as a reference, which is a C library, which uh, is actually pretty good and pretty structured and gave me a, a hint and implements like 200 devices or something like that, uh, especially in mine. Uh, libdivecomputer is pretty interesting. It has a natural layering on the hardware type that you actually have. So um, this, device is built by a vendor called Aqualong, that's the maker, but the hardware type is actually Oceanic, which a, a number of other um, vendors use, um, and the exact memory layout type that I'm going to find here. Um, and that works mostly, like all this works mostly by listing how big is a memory page on this computer, how can this memory on this computer be addressed? Is it a USB computer or does it use serial um, for uh, contact? This one is using serial. Um, but it, what's interesting about it, it's fully iterator based and it's fully dynamic dispatch based. So everything it does for all these implementations is um, write out buckets of functions that are like, okay, so how do I read a page from this specific model of computer? and and then put those in the V table and use an abstract interface to interface with that. Um, connecting to the computer is pretty simple. It's a little bit verbose, but there's a serial port library in, um, in Rust that you can use. And you just filter all your serial ports of your computer. The only thing that you need to know is the so-called VID, which is the vendor ID and the PID of your uh, USB device. So Aqualong is 1027. They've registered for that. And, um, PID is the, um, is the actual device ID. So, and if you want to send a message to it, the, the first message to send is you take that computer handle, um, then you open uh, this port using the serial port library. And the only thing that you send to it is 0xA4 and zero. So all of those messages end in zero. You do port write to it and it will respond with its 
name. And the, we did want to get a little bit more out of this machine than just its name. And it's pretty interesting to see how the memory model works. What it gives you is it gives you direct memory access to actually everything that's on this device or that's in the, um, in the memory that's intended to be read by me. And this is actually pages numbered from one to 512. And um, those are one kilobyte pages. And um, correct. And um, the and each of these has special data in it. The most interesting one being um, the page sixty four, which has the dive page pointers. I go to uh, what the dive page pointers are in a second. Uh, oh, there's a typo there. So the memory layout of this device is extremely simple. It has a block for all device info. So everything, current settings and whatever. It has this one page of location pointers and where do those location pointers point? There's two ring buffers. One is for the logbook and one is for the dive profile. And that's a different thing. The logbook holds data like this person has dived for 10 minutes, maximum depth 25 meters um, at 9.30 came back up and maybe a flag ascent was too, too, too fast or not. That's, that's what we call a logbook. And then there's the dive profile and the dive profile is the thing that gives you um, all those small data points that actually collect this. Um, I'm only going to care about the logbook ring buffer um, for the sake of this talk. Everything else is pretty much the same. But... And uh, the dive computer actually gives me this uh, information in an easy portable way. Um, so this is my port of their layout structure, it gives you the memory size. It gives you um, uh, information if there's high memory in the computer. So for everyone who used computers in the 90s and the early 90s, these small things still have high memory. Um, and it gives you the location of the CF pointers page where all these pointers are. And those pointers point to one page that is somewhere in this logbook, um, in this logbook ring buffer, or some of these pointers. These pointers point to everything in this memory space. All of the important information is, uh, is in this one page. And we can just read that. Um, so create a, a, a vector that is as big as the page size of this, uh, of this computer. Um, and then we say device read from the support pointers and read that into the vector. Device read being a function that, um, that uh, reads that page over the serial port. And then we need to interpret this. And that's where it gets interesting. Um, all of these um, pointers are 60, 16 bits. And the easiest way I found to actually decode that is using the byte order library and the, the cursor library. So the cursor library have, having the advantage that I don't have to do any kind of pointer calculation to advance my position in this, uh, in this byte field. Instead, I can say, I know that the two pointers that I'm interested in are at index four and following, and then I can reach two pointers using the cursor and the cursor reads, uh, uh, holds my current state. In the original the dive computer um, uh, library, this would be a lot of pointer mangling and keeping basically this read state in a separate pointer variable. So this is how we find out the places of the, uh, of the pages that we're interested in reading. So this is in this, um, in this ring buffer, where is the last written log and where is the, um, <clears throat> and where is the first written current log. If the computer has been in use in a, for a while, these will be at uh, pretty much the same location because then you go around the ring. And if you want to read a page, um, libdive computer, for, for example, does it. Um, so what you need to send is you need to send um, 0xp1, just that's the command for read me a page, the page number as a U16, 16, 16 bit uh, pointers, and then zero. And in C, you would actually do that by uh, just creating an in-memory array and doing a little bit of bit shifting. 
this looks very unrusty. In Rust, the best version I found was also again using um, uh, using uh, the cursor and um, the uh, byte crate. So um, the one thing that you need to care about is that in every Rust code base that interface with these uh, protocols, you need to make sure that you actually write the zero by yourself to this pointer, uh, to, uh, to this um, to this array. Um, I don't want to go much further into code. Um, I had a couple of interesting experiences with this code base right, while porting this code base, and uh, I found that. I found the libdive computer code base very, very easy to read and very, very idiomatic and easy to follow. Um, but the structure was definitely not something that I was used to as a, as a Rust programmer, um, especially in the sense that it encoded far more things as pointers while Rust heavily relies on having special data types abstracted as values, for example, the cursor type to, um, to implement the same kind of functionality. So the, there's a huge difference in algorithm abstraction or in algorithm implementations, for example, through using this cursor type. Um, Rust heavily favors indexing and C favors pointer calculations. So my Rust code base is much index heavier than, um, than the uh, C code base. Um, and I find it quite interesting that this code base was much more on the side of using dynamic dispatch on the C side, while Rust favors um, using generics and uh, ending up with um, non-dynamic dispatch at a lot of places. Um, I also found a number of interesting problems while porting the library and the dive computer goes back to 2005 and has a number of optimizations. So for example, I found it very, very hard to find out how they actually read the logbooks until I figured out that they actually read them backwards. And for my first implementation, I would have just read them forwards. The reason why they're reading it backwards is because this is used in, uh, in applications that read from the slow devices. And reading backwards means you will pretty quickly find out if there's a dive that you have already synced with, and then you can just stop the operation. So all the iteration works uh, backwards in time, but that's really unintuitive if you actually just want to find out uh, how, how the device works and, and want to make it build a bug a bug free implementation first. Um, and the, um, so the, and the library itself is very, very vast. So for example, just for this uh, make of computer, they support three different kinds of page models. So different kinds of page sizes, arrangements and whatever, um, pretty often if there's just a single, uh, just a small difference with um, uh, with huge if else conditions, like if this is a computer of that kind, do it like this. If it's a computer of that kind, do it like that. Um, I have a couple of uh, takeaways from this experience. Dive computers really are stupid in their implementation. If they kiss applied very, very thoroughly um, and focus on the right parts. For example, what I found awesome was uh, the user's documentation of the whole thing that even documents that if um, this number only has two digits, if it's 99, it might be higher and that's okay. <laughs> um, lingo is still the hardest thing that you need to learn before porting. So for example, knowing what a logbook, what the logbook actually means and what uh, that term is in, in the divers term was what I learned um, by, by doing this or what a log entry is. Um, a good C code base is cool to read upon, but it's a mediocre architecture reference. You can, it's basically uh, um, archaeology trying to figure out what kind of architecture this C code base is targeted to. And I'm not talking about um, machine architecture, but actually the memory architecture of this device. It, the whole thing would have been much easier if there was just a data sheet available that I could implement off. Um, and the page-based model is actually nice to learn on, on a computer that really has, literally has pages from zero to 512, and you can start um, uh, moving through these. And yeah, um, 
also, if you had a look at the name of my live computer that it reports, um, whoever at this vendor had the idea that uh, null byte null byte is an appropriate separator, um, I don't know, I'd like to buy you a beer. And yeah, and I actually start working on the project um, because I got everything out of it that I was able to learn and enough insight. There's no way I can see a port of the dive computer to Rust um, as useful. It's not in any way security critical. It has support for hundreds of computer models and I just have no access to testing them and I don't want to have that access. Um, but having a look at it, the iterator model is very easy to interface with using Rust and dynamic dis the dynamic dispatch model that it uses is very easy to interface with using Rust. And yeah, I got my fun out of that part. And so I'm going to scrap this code base. That's also why you can't find it online. Um, next up, I actually want to write a binding to the drive computer and then um, have a look at how these uh, calculation algorithms actually work. Like how, uh, how much is the projected net and metric and saturation that you had like after five minutes of this dive or something like that. I don't know how to check this, but just for fun and understanding how this works and as my final conclusion, it's quite nice to actually understand how the thing works that makes sure that, you, um, that you're going, coming back up safely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Florian. Thank you. This was interesting. It was very interesting. Um, questions. I couldn't find any questions on Matrix or on Zoom. Um, <laughs> one person, where do, where do you go diving at in Berlin? Um, so, <laughs> I would not call it diving, uh, but it basically any lake around Berlin has a dive site and they go down to up to 10 meters. <laughs> but there's a um, there's a very good um, dive center, uh, Tauchzentrale, which I can highly recommend, um, which regularly drive out of town and uh, and can help you with that. Um, yeah. Also, forgot to mention Jan Eric, who is running the meetup here, is my diving buddy, whom I learned uh, diving with. So if anyone wants to go rustation diving, please let us know. We can have an underwater meetup maybe at some point or an underwater talk. It, the, nice th the nice thing about diving is that people don't talk. And uh, Linus Torvalds <laughs> is actually a huge diver. So if you want to go diving with Linus Torvalds but don't want to be insulted, you can do that. Good tip. I can um, share the PowerPoint. Yeah. See the question. Cool. And we got, yeah, great, um, excellent presentation. Nice presentation, very informative, good feedback. No questions left. And nice. Okay. Thank you for your talk. Yeah. Um, next up is Rust in the browser from Maximilian. Yeah, hello. I'm not going to save lives today, but um, I worked on a project that made my life a lot easier. And that's what I want to share. So here we go. How do I kill this off? Uh, I don't know if you see this weird bubble here from Zoom, but I'm just gonna start. All right, rest in the browser. Um, a few years ago, this would probably uh, be the headline if I can get it to work. No, you mad bro is in there because it was really tough to get Rust working in the browser. Um, but I was keen on trying it again because I had the use case. So who am I? Um, I've been a web developer for around seven years now. Uh, worked in a few companies, did a lot of JavaScript. I go by BMF on the internet. You can see my website right there. It's elas.berlin. Yeah, and I got into Rust a few years back when there was this whole Go versus Rust thing for low level stuff going on um, because I found it intriguing to get the power of C without all the headache, uh, all this pointer magic. Um, the outline of this talk first, why do I need rest in the browser? Is that really necessary? A lot of people might say no. Um, how did I do it? What was good about it? And 
what was not so good about it. So yeah, why do I need it? I have a lot of stuff at home. I have photos, some movies, music, books, documents, papers, YouTube stuff. Um, and I have friends and family around the world that I want to share this with. At the same time, I have calendars, I have a lot of meetings that I want to coordinate with people. And I would like to not use Google, Apple, etc. Um, for storing them, to have, not have them parse them for advertisement or whatever, basically because yeah, I can. So this is the setup, right? I have my network attached storage here in my home. I have a laptop and a phone that are in Germany. And then at the other side of the world, I have my girlfriend who has a phone and a laptop in Singapore. And she also wants to access, let's say, my movies or my photos. You can see this red line here that the idea is to connect them somehow to get her into my home in an easy way. Uh, there are multiple ways to do this. Um, WireGuard is the one that I chose. So if you've not heard about WireGuard before, this is um, VPN technology. So you can see a fast, modern, secure VPN tunnel. I got really fascinated by it because it runs inside the kernel. Um, it's only three to 4,000 lines of code. It's way, way smaller than alternatives such as OpenVPN. It's very opinionated. And it's very fast. It's just, it's really, really nice. Go check it out. It has Rust user space implementation as well. Uh, loads of apps for other devices. Can highly recommend it. And Jason Donenfeld, the guy who wrote it, is, is he's really nice. Um, yeah, so how do you use WireGuard? Right? If you want to connect all your devices, each of these devices needs a key pair. So you need to generate key pairs on the command line. Then if you have a server, right, everything runs through a single server. In my setup, you can have multiple servers, but you need some place where these devices can go to and ask, okay, how do I get to the other device? And this server needs to be updated with the keys so that it can coordinate the communication between all the devices. So every time you want to add a device, you need to update it on the server. If you want to remove a device, you need to know its public key, then you need to go to the server and remove that public key. Yeah, all in all, it's quite difficult um, if you don't have tooling. So how do I want it? Yeah, I want it to be easy to add new devices without copy and pasting keys around. I want to immediately have the device active if I add it to the network and I want to easily maintain the network, right? If I, if I remove a device, I want it to be offline immediately. I don't want to SSH into my server, go look at some notes on how to do it properly. I just want it to be done. So I set out to do it during the quarantine. Um, and I'm going to, give you a quick demo. You can find it online if I'm going through it too fast or you just want to play around with it. It's at HTTPS vid.network. Um, this is how it looks like. All right, there's documentation. You can get, check out the GitHub. But I basically have a server, which I call vidbot. Uh, I find it pretty cool to have a robot in the cloud. Um, and I can go here. Right? I can add a new laptop. Laptop 2. All right, let's give it an IP inside the network. It's running Linux. Save that. It's up here. I can click download. All right, and I got the configuration. So you got a public key, some private key, bunch of stuff that you don't really need to care about right now, unless you want to use WireGuard. Um, but that's the whole idea. So you get this configuration from the website. Um, and everything is applied automatically to this server. And now I'm going to show you how I did that. Um, and yeah, that's where Rust comes into play. So what you just saw is the interface um, here at the top left. Right, I have a server, I have a few devices in that interface, then I have a store, which is, uh, if you are familiar with front-end development, that's where all the data gets stored, right? So you can have reactive components throughout your website. Um, and an API service talks to the VidBot here. And the, this down here is on the bottom right is my internal network where I now want to add a new laptop. So what I just did is I touched this devices form on the website um, and I added the new laptop. So keep that in mind that at the bottom left is the new, lap, net, uh, the new laptop that I'm adding to the network. 
once um, I add the device, it goes into the store. The store knows that something changed. It's calling the API service. The API then talks to this vidbot, right, at port 3000, which is a Rust API written in warp. Um, once it receives the payload, it has to update the configuration on the server. When the configuration gets updated, system D, uh, if you're familiar with Linux, this handles all the processes, needs to restart the WireGuard interface. Um, how does it do that? So what I use is I notify, it looks at the file system and says, okay, this file changed, please do something. So in this case, the WG0 configuration, which is the WireGuard configuration changed. System D restarts the WireGuard process. Um, WireGuard picks up the change at the WG0 interface and the new laptop is added. So that's a lot of stuff, right? It's a, if you're not familiar with this, it's probably yeah, what is going on. Um, the WG0 thing at the bottom next to the ETH0, it's an interface. So your computer thinks it's just another network interface. It doesn't know that anything VPNE is running. It just thinks, okay, it's a network interface. And that's the nice thing about WireGuard. Um, also, this allows you to uh, use all the existing tooling that is inside of Linux. That's why I'm able to use iNotify, systemd, and I don't have to build all of this stuff. All I have to really build is the API service and the connection between the interface and the vidbot. And this is where stuff gets tricky. Right, there are a few problems. So the first problem is that all the configurations need curve 25519 cryptographic keys. It's a specific mathematical curve for generating cryptographic keys. And I need those for WireGuard. So I need to create them in the browser. Uh, second of all, the app needs to be unique to the browser. I don't want someone to go in and change my server configuration. Um, I need to update the server when, and reload the interface whenever anything changes, which is what you just saw with the systemd and I notify. And to be honest, I don't want to do security in JavaScript. Like not having types, even though there's TypeScript, it's just, yeah, I don't want to do it. I didn't even start. I was like, okay, this is not going to happen. I'm going to look into Rust and if Rust can't do it, then I'm not going to build this project. So how did I do it? Um, my solution is to use Rust on both sides. I can rely on existing libraries. Um, I have the same libraries on the front end and the back end, which is nice because I only have to read documentation once and I can ensure that they stay up to date and are compatible with each other. And I encrypt all communication between the browser and the bot with a browser unique key pair. So libraries that I use, system-wide libraries, so that means they run on the front end and on the back end are the cryptography libraries from Dalek. You can find them here, which is X25519, which is generating that curve. And then I use another one uh, called ED25519, which is helping me to generate signatures, which I then use to um, sign the payload for the back end. Um, but I'll go into that in a bit. And then I use 30, which is awesome. It's serialization done right. I don't know, I guess that's how I can describe it. Here's the vertbot, which is the backend. Um, we're only going, gonna go into it shortly. It's instantiated with uh, the browsers, like a public key that is running in the applications so in the browser. Um, so that means that you have to set up the interface first. How do you set it up? You basically visit the website, it's done in the background. But then you get a public key, you start your server with this public key, and then the webbot is able to verify that your browser is the one sending the payload, right? There's a signature, it can verify it with the public key, and we don't need user accounts and all that stuff. I'm using warp for the API, I mentioned this, it's awesome. If you've read the Twitter paper, um, server as a function, this is pretty much an implementation of that, I feel like. Uh, if you haven't read it, go read it. I can highly recommend it and check out Warp. Once you wrap your head around it, it will make a lot of things easier, especially cores. So cross origin request stuff gets a lot easier. Uh, you can just plug a filter in there. Then systemd for the process management 
<clears throat> and restarting the interface and I notify tools to pick up any changes on the file system. And here's what I actually want to talk about now, the interface library. So how do you get REST in the browser? It sounds like a nice language to have in the browser because of the types, the compiler, the libraries. Um, but yeah, the browser usually runs JavaScript. So how do you do it? Um, there is WebAssembly, as a lot of people are probably aware, and there's a lot of really nice tooling uh, available. And the first of those is wasn't bind gen, right? Uh, all of these, by the way, are in github.com slash rust wasn't. You can find all of these libraries in there and there's pretty good documentation. Um, so what does wasn't bind gen do? Uh, it automatically generates the bindings between Rust and JavaScript for you. So if you look at these two examples, I have this generate key pair function in Rust that takes no arguments, but returns a string. And then I annotate it with this wasn't bind gen. And this helps me to talk between Rust and JavaScript and I don't have to do anything. So right? in JavaScript, you just pass in nothing. You just call the function. Um, then Rust returns something and the bindings say, okay, where on the heap, right? The stuff gets saved on heap and where on the heap can I find this? Where in memory do I get the string? And then JavaScript can use that to read it back out. And all of that done is done in the background. So you don't have to worry about it. The same works if you pass in strings. So at the bottom you have sign message, right? Which signs the payload, it has a key pair and a message and then returns the signature. Um, but you also have to get it running in the browser, right? Just generating the bindings will not help you. You still have just the wasn't module and some JavaScript. How do you get it in the browser? So wasn't pack, right? It can generate publishable WebAssembly packages for you automatically. And I'm just gonna show you a small video. I hope this works. So you run wasn't pack, it builds everything, that's it. I mean, it's all there, <laughs> that is just awesome. Um, so what that also means is that it, since it's NPM publishable, you can just hook it into your existing build pipeline. So if you know how to use Webpack, this becomes a breeze. Um, lastly, there is console error panic hook. Um, Okay, tooling is great, you got your running in the browser, but you're still gonna make uh, mistakes, right? The, the compiler is gonna catch a lot of them, but not all of them, and errors do happen. And if they happen, uh, if you don't use this library, you're gonna pull your hair out, right? So this really, really, really helps with debugging um, or even figuring out what's wrong in the first place or where something is going wrong. So let's say I have an error on my code, I got a panic, and I don't use console error panic hook. Great name, by the way. Uh, I just get runtime error, unreachable, executed, right? I catch this error on my JavaScript. So at the bottom, I get WebAssembly key generation is going wrong, but I don't really know where the, the error happens. So I Googled on it. This happened to me, right? So then I started Googling. Um, should have read the documentation better in the first place. But anyway, I came across this library, initialized it. And there we go. Now I get panicked at test in source lib.rs on line 40. I can go in there, I can check out what's wrong, fix the error, um, and life's easy again. So those were the most important interface libraries, right? It wasn't bind gen to generate the bindings between Rust and JavaScript, so you don't have to know about the memory layout. Um, wasn't packed to get everything into the browser, console error, panic hook to make development nice and easy and help out when errors do occur. And everything can be found in the Rust version uh, organization in GitHub. So pros and cons. Um, I already mentioned this, but if you know your way around Webpack, wasn't pack makes integration a breeze. It takes, what, five to 10 minutes to get this running. It's, uh, it, I was blown away. I did not think it would be that easy. Uh, testing is included as well, so you can write um, unit tests for your uh, WebAssembly stuff. Cargo feature flags are just amazing. I mean, I didn't know about them. I didn't have any use case. Uh, I wrote a few small things uh, for the command line in Rust, but I never really used feature flags. But here, I'm going to come there in a second. They were really, really, really helpful. And the, the documentation in Rust is just 
I mean, docs.rs and clicking away around when you have to read about cryptographic signatures. I mean, that was awesome. Uh, yeah, but cons. There are still some cons. Uh, it is the, the bundle size is quite big. So I think it's 600 kilobyte in my case, um, which doesn't matter because I only download the application once and it runs to my browser. It's a single page app. The, the rest of the application is, I don't know, 300 kilobytes. So all in all, it's still less than a megabyte. But the bundle size really like takes a lot of that. Um, there are ways around this. You can use different memory, memory allocators, but they don't work with all libraries. Um, so in my case with this cryptographic stuff going on, I was not able to use the, the Wii allocator easily. Um, I also haven't figured out how to conditionally load the console error panic hook. So what I have to do right now is while I'm in development, I call this function globally. So it's enabled and when a panic occurs, I get a nice uh, message in the console. Um, but when I want to push it out into production, I have to remove this manually. Um, there's probably a way around this. If anybody knows, I would really appreciate some help uh, on the repository. Um, otherwise, I keep reading until I find it. Uh, other cons, if you use REST in the browser, you don't have threads. And this is where the feature flex really come in handy. So a lot of libraries, I don't know, not a lot. I don't know this, but the ones that I use have feature flex for disabling thread support. Uh, so you can run everything on a single thread. Um, it's really helpful. You just have to be aware of it, that if your library only works multi-threaded, you will not be able to use it in the browser. Um, besides that, there's only 32 bit support at the moment. If you check out this link here, WebAssembly future features, um, there will be linear memory bigger than four gigabytes in the future, but it isn't there yet. Um, there is one more thing that I checked. So let's go to wasn't binding. I just checked this earlier. Um, and I'm sure people are, might be interested in this. You can't only do strings, right? There are other things. You can put an array, which are going to be boxes, right? So they're going to uh, go onto the heap and then you can store integers, uh, for example, of floats. I, I saw that it's possible to get 64 bit uh, integers there. And I'm not sure how this relates to my last point here about the uh, 32 bit only. If somebody knows, uh, um, I'd be happy to learn. Um, all in all, I can say it was, really amazing to use rust here um, and i was blown away but it, it took me two days to get rust completely set up and understand how everything works and write the encryption which was i mean it's a very short time for me i'm not an expert on this in any way um so i can highly recommend it if you have any project where let's go to the pros it's better uh, if you have any project where you want to use rust in the browser i think it's there uh, you can start doing it, even if it's image manipulation or video manipulation, audio manipulation. Um, by using the boxes, it might st still be a bit slow. I don't know how fast this is. Um, benchmarked it, but it's definitely possible now. And it's surely faster than JavaScript. Uh, if you would like to find out more, everything I did is open source. It's AGPL 3.0. There's the whole front end code, the vid bot, all the tooling around it. Uh, documentation for users and developers. You can use the thing at vid.network, build your own VPN, have WireGuard running and get your own super high-speed VPN. Um, if you just want to use Rust in WebAssembly, check out Rust version, read the documentation, use it, it's amazing. Um, yeah, if you have questions that we can't answer now, you can reach me at max at elas.berlin or on Twitter at bmf underscore max. And that's it. Hey, thank you so much for this amazing talk. Um, it's very, very insightful. So we have one or two questions. Um, I start with a metrics chat and one person asked, um, can you use web workers? I have no idea. I didn't come across it. Okay. Um, next question is, um, what happens to ongoing ongoing media streaming while the bot server is restarting? Uh, it's a, by a new device added. 
Yeah, that's a good question. This came up already on Reddit. Um, I think it interrupts, right? There is this persistent keep alive from WireGuard um, that's going to send packets to, to keep the connection alive. Um, this might kick in. If your device is trying to reach the network again, it might just pick up the connection, right? It's going to buffer, it's going to drop, but then it should reinitialize. Uh, I haven't seen any problems with it, but people on Reddit already said there's probably better to not restart the interface, but you know, keep all the collections alive somehow. It was beyond me and it was beyond what I built this for. Uh, if anybody has the technical capabilities, I'd love some help. Oh, thank you. Um, two more questions. Why did it take so long to set up in the beginning? Um, this was mostly reading and about the libraries. I, the, the setup, getting it, I use a very specific front end build, which is the view CLI. So I had to figure that out. Then I don't work eight hours a day on this, right? So it took two days of, I don't know, however long I worked on it. Um, I had to integrate it with my existing tools. And then I had to read about the libraries that to figure out uh, feature flags, um, that there are no threads, 32 bit support. So uh, that was the, the biggest issue. Okay, um, let's combine the last two questions. Um, can you say can you say something more about Warp? And did you have the chance to work with um, with with futures? And how was the experience? Um, yeah, I use it only with uh, await async await. Um, so Warp, I think Bastian also used it. I talked to him. Uh, I think he even wrote a blog article about it. Maybe it's better to check it out. It's, it's really nice once you wrap your head around it, but that can take a while, right? So it took me, um, I, I can't give you a time frame. Uh, it took me maybe a day to really understand what the filters and the services do. But once you get, once you get it in your head, you can like combine all these filters together and it becomes really easy to extend your existing API endpoints or group them together. And for example, like cross origin requests, stuff, just put it on all your endpoints in one line. Um, there were some issues I had with the types. So I wanted to extract the filter at one point and it became a bit complicated. Um, but yeah, once you get there, you, you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's too difficult to just say from ahead right now. Yeah, this was definitely yeah, my experience too. Like the filters were really, really weird in the beginning, but then once it made click, it was actually super helpful. Okay, I think now Kiffin, I don't know if I pronounce it right, can take over the screen. I think you're muted. Now it should be okay. Yeah. Yeah, now it works. All right, I'll try uh, again, rewind. Yeah, uh, hello, my name is uh, Kiffin Gish, and uh, I'm currently giving this presentation from uh, Gouda in the Netherlands, which is uh, near Rotterdam. And uh, first of all, uh, my appreciation for being allowed to give this presentation. Um, I've always found these meetups very interesting, and I figured it was high time for me to, to uh, contribute back uh, to the communi community. Um, I was planning on giving a, a live coding session at first, but I figured the, the slot of 20 minutes was a bit too limited for such complex and time consuming uh, material. So I chose instead to give mostly uh, sheets and I'll throw in a couple demos in there if time uh, allows. The, um, yeah, the title of my presentation is uh, Embedding Rust in uh, Node.js Applications. Uh, the agenda uh, will be that I'll give you an introduction uh, into Rust and Node.js. Uh, I'll move into telling you a bit about building um, a C API in, in Rust. Um, moving on to uh, Node.js, which provides uh, a, an, an API called uh, Nappy and API. And then finally, uh, embedding Rust in Node using uh, two libraries uh, that I played around with. One is a, a low level uh, unsafe uh, library called Node.js Sys, 
And there's another fancier, uh, more popular uh, one called Neon, which is a high level uh, safe uh, library. Uh, the goal of this presentation, I guess, is yeah, tickle your fancy and hopefully encourage others to get more involved with Rust. Um, let's start. So who am I? Introduce myself. Yeah, I was born and raised in sunny California. I've survived up to now uh, nearly 40 years uh, of hacking through my life. I started way back with Assembler, Unix, uh, and C. I was actually one of the rebels who decided that Assembler didn't, you know, didn't give me the stuff I needed, and I moved to C. So I was considered a rebel and cast aside, but I held in there. Uh, eventually became, I guess you call a full stack developer. Uh, later on, I got the rust itch uh, and can't get enough. And as you can see, I'm also uh, an avid uh, golfer. So everything I'm going to tell you on this presentation is available on my GitHub. Uh, I've created uh, a repository called rust node add on template. And that's where you can find all the code samples, all the nitty gritty uh, details. And uh, you can look through there if your heart's to light. So, um, yeah, why are we using Rust? Um, well, for the people that are not yet quite familiar with Rust, I can explain the main characteristics which have uh, appealed to me. Uh, it's safe, uh, it's fast, it's uh, concurrent. And also very important is that there is no garbage collection. Um, why use it with, with Node? Um, the reason I chose the of doing Rust uh, with Node is I have a background in web development. So one of the first things I really wanted to uh, explore was how it interacts uh, uh, with Node.js. Uh, um, and one of the benefits of, of using Rust, as far as I see, is um, yeah, the speed, obviously. Um, it has a, a very strong interoperability uh, with external libraries, what they call FFI, a little bit about that shortly. Uh, there is no runtime uh, overhead, and it gives you um, a yeah, fairly predictable performance. If you look at Node.js, it has uh, garbage uh, collection. So um, if you have like an, uh, an embedded device running Node.js that has to um, do measurements every millisecond and send it out. You definitely uh, don't want to, you know, lose that if it's critical uh, information. And I think Rust provides an interesting uh, opportunity to improve that. Uh, also, yeah, I'm really into these things. This is a Raspberry Pi, but I really am interested in the low level access that it provides uh, to hardware in terms of device drivers. We've got a bit of a case of that in the first uh, presentation, which uh, got me all excited. So FFI, foreign function interface, we'll cover that shortly, as I said. And the idea that I want to uh, propose is that if you have an existing node uh, JS uh, application uh, running somewhere, either in a server environment or on a, uh, on a device, you might want to look at the performance of the critical modules, the areas that are uh, causing problems. And after I uh, finish this presentation, hopefully you will understand a bit better of how you might take those critical modules uh, and rewrite them in Rust and provide that functionality as an add-on in uh, Node.js. Okay, let's start with FFI. First, I'm going to get some water. So, um, FFI is a, a way uh, for uh, uh, Rust to be able to uh, use external C modules. Um, as you can see on the top, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but uh, external C provides uh, a, a declaration of an external function. 
for simplicity here, I, I realize this is a bit of a contrived example, but it's purely for illustration purposes, just to give you a bit of hint of, of what I'm trying to explain. So we have an external C function. It could be anything, but in this, in this we will use even the, the square root uh, function. And uh, we use this compiler directive uh, in front of main called uh, link. And what it tells you is that when you do hot cargo run, you want to link it with a lib m uh, uh, directory, which contains a square root function. And then in main, I have a, I define x as a, a floating floating points uh, sixty four, and the result uh, I call that function and I print out the result here. Now, you always have to use unsafe uh, because uh, the Rust compiler uh, is unable to check. Uh, calls to external languages. So you are required to bracket them using the uh, unsafe. All right, let's go one bit higher is uh, let's assume that we want to use the lib m crate. Uh, and we uh, grab the square root there. Um, and we can use that crate and make a direct call to the square root function. And as you see here, uh, there's no need to uh, call safe uh, in front of it, which makes it a bit nicer. And of course, I know all you uh, Rust fans out there realize that the best way to do it is just to use the parameter type F64, which includes, by definition, a square root function, which you can call directly. If you're more interested in safe and unsafe, I have to admit that I found that very difficult uh, to understand. I think uh, next to lifetimes and borrowing, it was the hardest thing for me to get my head around. But you can look in uh, Rustonomicon, which provides a nice uh, explanation about it. And you can also look in the log in the, in the Rust book. This just shows you the entry in uh, here to see the safe and unsafe uh, functions or in the book, of course. Beautiful, beautiful documentation. I mean, this is stuff you can really uh, appreciate. <laughs> okay, let's talk about now about rest inside of a, a C project. Yeah, C, C++. Um, and Basically, um, I, I've taken this from the interoperability guide, Rust with C, and you want to um, basically do two things. You want to create a, a C-friendly API in Rust, and then you have to uh, embed the, the project in uh, some kind of external build system, the binding, which will bind you to the, to the C. Um, and at the moment, um, C is the only uh, possibility, so that's why you use extern C in your Rust code to tell it that it's going to uh, have to use an uh, external C function. And more information here. Again, all these links uh, that I'm showing you are, sh are provided in the GitHub uh, that I showed at the beginning of this presentation. Okay, so there are a couple things uh, that you have to uh, keep in mind when you're writing a, a C API. One is the compiler uh, directive no mangle, which prevents the Rust compiler from um, mangling, changing the name, because if you want to extern, uh, extern, uh, make it interoperable and available externally, it has to keep the same, uh, same name. And of course, extern C. So uh, as I showed in that previous uh, contrived example, you use extern C in your function uh, declaration. There's an example here. So here you'll see the no mangle and you see an external C for the function. Okay, now a bit of the nitty gritty. 
the Node.js provides an API called N Appy, pronounced N as in the letter followed by API. Nappy, N Appy. I'm still not sure what that means. Um, and what this API does is it allows you to bind directly into Node.js, which is uh, pretty neat. I won't read all the text, but you can go there and you see in the Node.js here, uh, a whole description of the N API and, and what it does. And um, yeah, it's pretty complicated. Um, there's so much information that it's really hard to figure out what's really important, what's not. So hopefully the struggles that I went through will help someone in the future to be able to focus and dive into the uh, important parts. When you look at the entry into this documentation, you see there are just zillions and zillions of uh, available hooks. Okay. So uh, then I started looking around uh, the available crates. Uh, I read actually a couple articles or videos where someone had used Node.js sys and thought it was great, wonderful, awesome, as you say nowadays. So it provides a native binding to the Node.js uh, and API. I thought I would give that a go. And looking here, if you look in the documentation, you can see a whole list of stuff that's pretty much uh, a one-to-one -one mapping uh, to the node uh, nappy. So nothing exciting. Um, it provides you an unsafe external C into uh, various uh, functions that are required in order to create an API. How do you create this thing? Okay, so let's create a package and um, you do the good old cargo init lib and you pass an extra uh, option called uh, dash dash create dash type. And this is a flag uh, which um, tells the uh, tells cargo run to build a, a dynamic library uh, depending upon the uh, operating system that you're uh, using. And as usual, you'll get a project directory that looks like this. Nothing surprising. If we look at the uh, cargo.toml file, we'll see that he has added a, a, a lib crate type here, what I just told you, to create a dynamic library. And of course, we have to add uh, Node.js sys ourselves to be able to use that crate. Um, the main way to hook into a Node.js uh, uh, application is with a module registration. It's a whole story. I won't go into details, but I'm just gonna say it's described here if you need to understand the real details. But basically what it means is in your code, in your library, you have to provide a, reg a, 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 a unsafe extern C function called nappy underscore register underscore module underscore bi. And that will be your entry point when that uh, is, uh, is loaded in your Node.js application uh, via a require. Um, now, once you have that you have to figure out a way to create your functions and in order to do that you have to go through a lot of you know, newfangled jumping through hoops type of stuff and you use two uh, functions called nappy create function and you use the name of the function which you put into a c string it only understands c strings and the result, you have to first create a, a, a zero, a mem zero uh, place for the result, and it will create a result, which you can return in the set name property, which basically 
um, includes uh, this function in the export exports here. Um, create function. Let's do a simple, simple, an example using Node.js sys. Uh, so we want to create a function called hello, uh, say hello, sorry. And um, in, in using the node sys uh, system, we have a create function and we have to create the name of it and we have to create a function and then we return uh, the uh, name property uh, into the exports. Obviously this is unsafe and the reason that you use unsafe here. Okay, so uh, let's look at say hello. What does it actually look like? Well, it's a bit unsafe externcy say hello, and you have to create a result. You have to create a string, uh, and you have to make a call to the nappy create string UTF eight, and it you pass it as a pointer and the length, and it returns to the result that you can pass back. Build and run now. Cargo build. Um, it will create um, a library uh, with a .so, which you have to copy into the index.node, which in your index.js file, that's the entry point of your node app. You will it will require it with uh, index.node, and um, you can call it to call it into your uh, node app. And you run that like node.index.js. I'm now gonna give you a demo. Don't get nervous, but I'm gonna do a, de a demo of add, how do we add two numbers? Um, let's see how it works. There it is. Add numbers. Um, it's called uh, unsafe extern C add numbers. I first uh, create a buffer uh, uh, the, in order to uh, put the values uh, in there. And I also create a result to pass back the result. I use something called CB info. I uh, get the values do the buffer, get the X and the Y parameters that are passed here. I calculate the value, I create a double and I pass back the result. Now, um, if I have a demo here, I'll show you how this works. And I have an index here. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this. I'm going to call it. So I have an add on index dot node here. And I'm going to call it like this. And I have a nice little script that will do this for me. And hopefully you can see this. And you will see a uh, register module has been called. It's registered the, the functions, a number of functions, one of which is add number. And I run it and I get a number back 7.4. So this is a node code calling into Rust. And as you can see here, I've just uh, printed uh, the add on add numbers and it's a native code function called add numbers. All right, that's the boring stuff. Good. So uh, you can imagine after doing all that stuff, uh, I got kind of crazy. Uh, I, I discovered another uh, crate called neon, which provides neon, uh, neon bindings. Um, but in a, in, a, in a more high level way, 
um, than what you just saw. And it, it's, it's done by providing a CLI, a neon CLI, which you have to uh, install, install and use it to create a, a new project. And you get a project tree that uh, looks something like this. So you have your index JS here and under native, um, you have the library and the build will automatically create a index.node in so that you can use to load in the index JS. Oops. This is uh, what the cargo looks like. Again, the crate type, CDlib, neon build, neon. Module registration is a lot easier than the previous example. And all you have to do is this, m.export function, say hello, say hello. Nice. And uh, the function that we're going to call say hello is also very simple. You don't have to worry about uh, mem zeros and unsafe stuff. You can just return uh, directly a, a string and it'll work. Now, the demo I'm going to show you is add numbers similar to the one that we had before but now using the neon. So um, pretty straightforward. You have a, an argument, which is the X value, your argument, which is the Y value. You add the result and you return the result as a CX number. And let's see if that works. Um, Yeah, so you see it also works, but in a much more elegant and fun way. Um, now, um, I also provide a number of other examples to pretty much cover the, amet, the gamut of returning objects and sending messages and that kind of stuff. But I also an example of an async function, the Fibonacci. Uh, which is uh, they, this one. I won't show you the, the example that I made in uh, Node.js because it's uh, awful to look at, but this is a bit nicer. And if I try to run it, let's see. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna run it like this. I'm going to uh, call it, it's an async function, and it will come back to me with a result. Uh, I need a pretty large a value of x. I don't know if any of you know off the top of your head what the answer is. Um, Kiffin, if I may briefly interrupt you, uh, yeah. we actually don't see um, your demo. We only see the slides. I assume you shared only the slides. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. Sorry for only mentioning it now. Okay, you should have told me earlier. Well, sorry. No, this my okay. All right. Um, well, I'll leave that up to the people interested. They can look at it on their own. Um, so what are the advantages of using Rust uh, with Node.js? Well, yeah, computational demands. Uh, the performance is predictable. And if you look at IOTs, uh, you, Internet of Things, you have low level access to GPU and GPIO. And which means, um, for example, if you have a lot of these devices all over the place, uh, either a fleet of vehicles or uh, measuring uh, sites throughout the countryside, and you can use cheaper hardware you can actually uh, save a lot of uh, money. So those that are budget minded will be interested to, in exploring this more. Uh, as usual, there are some disadvantages. Uh, yeah, you have to support another programming language. Um, might be a pain, might not be a pain. Might be fun to attract people that are interested in learning a, a new programming language. 
the tool chain is slightly different and the deploy pipeline might have implications on the current one that you're using. And yeah, steep learning curve. Look at my GitHub and you'll get everything you need to know. I provided it there for the people that were unfortunately eager to see my code, but couldn't because of a goof up I made. Sorry about that. <laughs> Hope you liked it. Um, if you, so with all the Corona uh, thing and losing my job, uh, I've been looking around uh, for work. So if you are looking for someone to help you out, I hope you can look me up. Uh, and these are my uh, details. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Uh, there was some hiccups. I'm sorry for not jumping in earlier. Thanks. Um, okay. For helping out. Um, questions. Let me browse through. I saw a question. Yeah, on metrics. A common trickiness with FFI is holding onto data from the other side. With the library that you're using, can Rust safely hold onto node values after the function exists and can node hold onto Rust values somehow? Can you repeat that, please? <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Um, one common trickiness with FFI is holding onto data from the other side. With the library that you are using, can Rust selfly, safely hold onto node values and can node hold onto Rust values somehow? Okay. Uh, what, by hold, you mean to uh, save a pointer to that data? I, I'm assuming that's. Uh, Bram asked this. Maybe Bram quickly can unmute and talk or answer the question yeah right exactly yeah i don't know i don't think so uh i don't know if that's useful or not how because um it's kind of anti-rust we have two uh two sides of the fence where the node can access and change uh values unawares of the of the uh node side or maybe I'm not seeing it clearly. Okay. Just typing. Yeah, let's do that offline then. So I'll continue. Um, yeah, um, let's move to another question until, okay, not important, thanks. <laughs> um, feel free to contact each other privately in like in metrics or in zoom um we have another question is there a way to share code bases between neon and wasmbind chen neon and what and wasmbind chen oh that's a good one i don't know we can ask the previous speaker <laughs> maybe he knows yeah, I also don't know that. <laughs> Sounds like an interesting weekend project. Right. Yeah, it does. <laughs> okay. If there are no more questions, and um, thank you for your talk. It was yeah. super interesting. My pleasure. And we can look at the code at the GitHub repository. Yeah. Cool. And then we have the last talk for today, which is about a Git UI. Yeah. Feel free to Hello, take everyone. over. Let me quickly share the screen. Can you give me a thumbs up when it works? Yeah, okay. it works. I assume it does. Um, so thanks for hanging in here. I know it's late and um, I try to be uh, quick and uh, I want to talk about Git UI today and uh, all the terminal awesomeness in Rust that I experienced while developing it. And um, because terminal applications or CLI applications in Rust are such a match made in heaven, basically, um, I decided to torture you with my poor PowerPoint skills, uh, skills with uh, explaining you all the 
things that I experienced here. Um, just kidding, of course. <laughs> so let's get into the terminal. Um, we're going to talk about Git UI today. And uh, who am I? I'm Stefan. Nice to meet you. Um, you find me on uh, GitHub and on Twitter under my uh, handle Extrawurst. I'm a game developer by trade, and I recently founded a company, um, Game Roasters. And uh, why am I telling you this anyways? Um, so uh, for this particular company and the projects we are working on, I started to use Rust two years ago, basically. And since then, uh, we shipped almost two titles with that. And um, let me show you quickly what kind of, kind of games that are. Uh, beautiful picture. Um, this is stack four. Okay, maybe not everything is fine on, on command line, but uh, let's open the actual picture. Um, so this is a connect four game uh, in uh, 3D uh, with real time PVP player uh, versus player on mobile devices. And uh, this is built on Rust technology. And uh, the current project is actually a little bit more complex. Um, it's a uh, tower defense PVP real time uh, game on mobile as well. And it's called Tower Rangers. Um, but we are here today to talk about terminal UIs, right? So um, what is Git UI? Git UI looks like that. And uh, I hope I didn't bother too many of you guys already on Twitter with my spam about the project. And uh, so some might already come across uh, screenshots, of, uh, screenshots of Git UI. I will show it to you in action in just a sec. Um, so what is Git UI anyway? It's a terminal UI for, for Git. Um, my main focus was to make it fast and lightweight and to uh, the second primary focus was to make it super easy to, to use for noobs like me in the terminal, because I'm definitely not someone who, is, uh, who grew up using Vim and uh, like remembering tons of shortcuts is definitely not my thing. I'm used to use GUIs, but um, due to circumstances, I uh, was looking around for a new Git tool and uh, I uh, came up with the idea that, hey, maybe, maybe uh, I just uh, look for something in, in the terminal, right? And um, let me quickly show you how Git UI looks in action. So um, it's uh, like a typical like, uh, Git interface. You can look at the log, you can stash stuff, you can look at your stashes, uh, you can like uh, stage stuff um, and look at your diff and so on. So um, pretty, um, like standard, I guess. Um, so a couple of you might now say, wait, what? Why? Isn't there stuff like that already, right? Um, of course, I looked into the like two most prominent projects that I could find, uh, TIG and LazyGit. And um, let me quickly open up uh, TIG here in my repository and you will see, hey, nice, it's a, it's a terminal application, right? It's exactly what I was looking for. Well, yeah, kind of, but it's uh, in my, for, for my definition of this uh, simplicity that I was looking for, it definitely didn't hold up because no one's telling me now what I can do here, right? What kind of keys I, I can hook into now and, and do stuff with. And of course there's a help, but to be honest, this isn't the kind of help um, I was looking for. So way too complex. Um, the second tool is uh, LazyGit that's written in Go. And um, it definitely comes much closer to what I was looking for in terms of uh, a nice UI and uh, usability. Um, if you open up uh, the help here, you'd see it's definitely not as much, but still quite some key uh, uh, shortcuts. Um, but it at least gives you s some sort of commands down at the bottom to tell you what's possible right now in this situation. And that's definitely something I was inspired by. But then I was coming across this uh, list here uh, of commits and I was wondering like, hey, wait, I have, I have more than 300 commits in my uh, repository. What, what's going on in here? And uh, I really had, I, I realized that they are kind of cheating with um, loading, lazy loading the entire uh, revision history once you are going beyond those first 300s. So I was intrigued to, um, to look deeper into those performance uh, differences between the applications. And uh, so the kind of comparison that I wanted to do was, okay, let's throw a like worst case scenario at it. Let's open the Linux, official Linux Git uh, repository in it. 
which at, time, at the time of my checkout was around uh, 900,000 commits. And um, I wanted to see like, how long does it take to open the whole revision history? How much memory does the application take uh, at the end? And uh, like, uh, how big is the binary anyways? Uh, is the UI freezing like uh, while loading the stuff uh, or does it even crash maybe? Um, so um, I'm gonna actually start looking into lazy git first. <laughs> to show you for your own eyes. Um, it takes a little longer to load the stuff. There's some files changing, changed here and um, you see the ref log and the it's, it's, it's pretty decent, decently quick. But of course, I'm interested in more than just the 300 uh, commits here, right? So let's scroll at the bottom. Hmm. Nothing's happening. Okay, so uh, we can actually uh, 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 scroll forward here because I did the test already before. It will take lazy git actually 57 seconds uh, roughly to load the entire history. And uh, it will then grow and blow up to about 2.6 gigabytes of RAM. And the binary size uh, in itself is already 16 megabytes. And um, as you will uh, see, um, as you would have seen is that the whole UI starts freezing once, uh, once it actually gets into, into loading the uh, remaining history. And sometimes I even experience crashes in there. So it didn't really hold up to the kind of standard that I was looking for. Um, pretty similar picture when you open TIG. Uh, it basically shows you nothing for the first 10 seconds or so. Uh, it looks like something's broken here, but at least it tells you it's loading. So let's give it a couple of seconds. Um, oh yeah, here we go. So now at least we can th scroll through the first 10,000 entries or so, um, uh, which I mean, it's, it's a problem if you're just interested in the latest stuff, right? If you have to wait every time like 10 seconds for the stuff to load. And you can see it's not even loading 30,000 30, entries yet. And we are already at the 30 second mark. So let's stop that here. Uh, what TIG actually will take is around four minutes to load the entire history. Uh, it's also going to grow up significantly to 1.3 gigabytes of RAM. I'm not going to free it up anymore. I don't know what they keep on holding there. I mean, they don't have a garbage collector to excuse themselves. Um, it's a C application, so they are definitely the winner in uh, binary size here, 600 kilobytes. and. Uh, the UI keeps pretty uh, uh, stable and, and responsive, but a couple of hiccups here and there, definitely. But definitely no crash, so that's definitely an upside. Now let's open up the repository with Git UI. Um, let's go into the log, and you can see it's also not possible, of course, to load it right away. But as you can see, we are already at the 200,000 commits mark, and we can basically smoothly scroll through the entire history here. Um, absolutely no problem. Uh, we can jump up again. And uh, yeah, I mean, of course we don't have as many features yet as some of the competitors, but uh, I also didn't uh, see a diff right away in, in TIG. That's definitely something I'm also gonna implement eventually. But yeah, um, we are now at like 800,000 and uh, it's, it's uh, done now, so. Oh, here we can scroll through everything. So it turns out it takes like around 24 seconds for Git UI to load uh, the entire history and uh, the application, uh, the, the memory footprint will be around 170 megabytes. And uh, unfortunately, I couldn't crunch the binary size lower to uh, than the 1.4 megabytes, but that's okay, I guess. And uh, there's definitely no freezing or crashing in, in the experience while loading this uh, history here. So I guess that's a success. Um, oops. So um, why did I choose to do it in Rust, right? So a little bit of history. My past is C++, C Sharp in a, in a pro professional capacity. And actually for all my side projects, I used D um, for 10 years or so before I started to look into Rust. Um, that was my uh, way to go. Nowadays, it's uh, professionally and uh, for side projects, the same picture. I'm using uh, Go wherever I need async, but we come to that later. 
um, and I'm using basically Rust for everything else. It's uh, uh, for for all the things that are need that need to interface to the CFFI, as we saw in the previous talk, uh, for CLI applications, for performance critical applications, and ex and, and especially for uh, portability reasons, because uh, for our games we need to target uh, like iOS and Android, and good luck building Go or D for that. That's uh, that's tough. <clears throat> So three things that I want to highlight that I experienced while building Git UI and uh, using Rust for it. And uh, those are uh, diagnostics, concurrency, uh, no surprise here, and community. So um, what do I mean by diagnostics? Um, so I, I think I read that somewhere before, but it's definitely true to me. Uh, the compiler really feels like uh, a peer programmer that you're that's sitting like sitting next to you and bothering you with uh, the uncomfortable questions like uh, why are you not handling this error you know unwrapping is not the the good way to go here um, and that sort of stuff um, and uh, clippy for me goes even further and is kind of a teacher because um, to be honest after i read the book and i played around with a couple of applications um, uh, Clippy really taught me, like uh, taught me basically like the remaining 50% of uh, of my Rust best practices that I'm using now. So it uh, gives me hints like um, uh, it would actually be more performant here to uh, to to use uh, to not clone or maybe you want to pass this via reference and not uh, just copy it. That sort of stuff. It's it's really convenient, and I will show you some examples. So um, I'm really religious about those uh, diagnostics because I'm, I'm totally convinced uh, to, to try to tackle as much stuff as possible already at compile time. And everything, every problem that's sorted out there is, is uh, something I don't need to debug uh, later. And especially when you ship stuff on devices, uh, you don't want to uh, try to debug that stuff when it's already shipped. Um, so I'm I'm actually using those uh, annotations here. Uh, I put it I put Clippy to ped pedantic. I really wanted to tell me every everything, every nitty gritty detail um, that I could be bothered with. Um, I I forbid completely forbid unsafe code uh, just to make sure that also nothing that I pull in is is uh, using it. And um, uh, no unwrapping, no panic. I, I want to force myself to uh, to handle every error that that's there and uh, to not uh, get uh, lazy at some point right um, one example of those errors that i want to show you uh, or clippy like teaching more better uh, for a better word uh, it's actually something stupid of course that i did i, I was filled i was using a filter map on an iterator basically just to filter out one particular item and then uh, going to this one only. And of course, there's a lint for that. And Clippy told me like, hey, you can just do find map here because you're obviously just looking for this one entry. I have no idea how they do that, but it's, it's just amazing. <clears throat> so second point, concurrency. I mean, um, of course, for uh, what you saw in Git UI, it's very important to, to uh, to run stuff multi-threaded because uh, we have to do certain expensive Git operations in the background uh, to not block the UI and to actually not get this this, this uh, hiccup experience. Um, so concurrency is super important, and um, I, I don't want to go into detail like uh, how how this is uh, so awesome in Rust. Uh, there's definitely long uh, articles to read about it, but they really keep up on the promise of this fearless concurrency, where uh, you, thanks to this strong typing system, the, um, the the guarantees to not have data races or, or stuff like that are actually like uh, poured into the type system um, and makes it super easy to make sure that you're not fucking up somewhere yourself where you didn't want to. And there's actually one super tiny example of this in the code base of Git UI where it's uh, basically using all those uh, uh, strategies. Um, so you see there's a mutex around shared data uh, to make sure that the type system guarantees that I'm not accessing it through uh, from multiple um, threads. And uh, this is actually the log uh, component. So um, the, the Git process uh, or the, 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 yeah, the process that uh, crunches through the entire commit history uh, basically keeps on adding commit IDs to this vector and grows it and grows it. 
And uh, the, the UI definitely looks into this vector when, every once in a while when it, uh, when it wants to update what's, what's visible. And that's uh, communicated back to the UI using these um, channels. So there's message passing going on um, so that it doesn't have to pull or whatever. And of course, we can also do like log free um, data types. Uh, there's a lot of stuff already built in into the standard library that's, that's pretty awesome and simple to use. Um, so I'm really a fan of, of that uh, uh, feature of, of Rust. And then last but not least, uh, the, the entire community is really what, what sold it uh, to me personally. So this, this uh, amazingly friendly atmosphere, those meetups, um, everything is recorded. That's definitely something I didn't uh, expect before when I was starting to look into Rust. I, I started to look for resources to, to learn about it. And there was so many videos and so many recordings, every conference. It's like so easy to catch up on stuff that happened over the last couple of years and uh, actually see also uh, some of the faces behind the language. And it's all free and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really cool to see also like that even the, the smallest meetups will have their uh, code of conduct, making sure everyone is aware of those um, like uh, community guidelines that Rust uh, wants to see. And um, I really experienced that myself when you have any sort of new question, once, once you start out and go into the Discord channels, uh, everyone's super friendly and there's always someone who wants to help out. That's really, really cool. And um, of course, thanks to Cargo and Crates.io, there's a ton of libraries that you can rely on. And uh, some, I mean, most of them are really actively maintained. Uh, I never really had huge issues. Uh, finding contact uh, to talk to the people working on it or even like contributing and everyone was super uh, uh, friendly and forward on this and that was really really awesome and uh, of course um, i'm using a ton of those libraries and that's why uh, that's some of the uh, details i want to tell you about this is um, the um, five major parts I would say um, I'm using is uh, Git, Git 2 RS, which is uh, like, a, like a wrapper around AC library that actually does all the accessing to the Git repository um, and makes this some uh, like at least safe and uh, at least le more Rust idiomatic. But I had to write my own wrapper around it again to, to make it uh, to actually be able to put stuff of it, uh, stuff like requests to it into uh, into multi threaded uh, like into threads. Um, for the UI, um, there's uh, on the bottom there's cross term, which is an amazing library which allows you to write a terminal like writing into the terminal in a cross platform manner. You don't have to worry about the different platforms and, and intricacies with the terminals on each. Um, but it's very low level. So basically you just get a buffer and you write like text and styles, like it's annotated with styles into it. And on top of that, I'm using TUIRS, which gives you a little bit more sophisticated feeling of, a, of an actual widget library where you can uh, draw like frames and uh, uh, get a lot of tooling that, that I'm gonna show you in a, in a bit. Um, on the concurrency side, there's two major libraries uh, with Rayon um, supplying me with a, with a thread pool and Crossbeam where I'm using the select uh, functionality and also the, the channels uh, from. <clears throat> so let's look at one of those uh, code snippets uh, to, to actually visualize how easy it is to, to make a decent UI in, in, a ter in the terminal uh, using two TUI. And as you can see here, uh, we just fetch a centered rect um, and we want to have it like taking a percentage of the screen. So it's uh, actually like uh, responsive to screen, uh, to size changes and, and also, and all sort of stuff. And uh, this is handled uh, for me. And I want to render a widget, which is actually a paragraph, which is, takes a iterator of, of text. And uh, a block in this terminology is basically the, um, the borders that you see around uh, the individual chunks of the UI here. And, uh, and that's basically it. You can give it a title. It, it makes sure that uh, the text is wrapped correctly and uh, that, that really lifts a lot of work uh, from, from me in, the, in this application. Um, Rayon, uh, as I said, is the thread pool. It's super convenient to just uh, shoot a, a synchronous operation into the uh, thread pool and, uh, and, and be done with it. Uh, but one major feature that I'm actually also using from Rayon is the global panic handler which uh, turned out to be a 
tougher thing with using the standard library threads because they uh, they don't provide a functionality like that. So uh, to to get something similar, I would have to wrap my my code in in that I'm running in threads actually myself to to catch panics. Like for diagnostic reasons, I definitely while developing wanted this um, because of course stuff breaks and I want to know where and why. Uh, so that's that's uh, pretty pretty helpful. And this is the most convoluted uh, example here, but it's uh, showing you that uh, we are using tons of channels, as I said, for this asynchronous operation stuff. And uh, the UI thread really doesn't have to do anything when nothing is sent to it. Like when no channel is doing anything or sending anything, the, the ter terminal application doesn't have to be redrawn. So I'm having this huge uh, select uh, giving it all the receivers um, that the application uses um, and then basically putting that into a select statement and block here until anything happens because otherwise we don't have to worry. And um, why am I not using this uh, fancy select macro? Um, because if you remember, I forbid using unsafe code and unfortunately the select macro actually injects a, um, like allow unsafe on, on the operations that you are using in here. So that's unfortunate, um, but this uh, code snippet is actually never changed since I set up the application. And so it's, uh, it's okay uh, that it's not that short and uh, simple. But uh, still there's stuff that I wish I would see in Rust as well. Of course, there's uh, nothing's ever perfect. And uh, I definitely wanted to uh, put some things uh, to, to think about in here as well. <coughs> so, um, Mature async. This is a totally like a totally different discussion, um, but it's definitely um, the reason why I'm still using uh, for some applications like Go components because I find it super uh, confusing this whole async situation in the in the ecosystem. Like having multiple executors, uh, don't know how to combine them, uh, don't know how to write a executor uh, a, 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 a agnostic library, and all these things are. I think are very like frightening for noobs like me. So definitely uh, something I hope uh, will eventually weed out and, and um, uh, like standardize in some sort of way. Um, since I love Clippy so much, I, I really, really hope uh, to be able to write custom lints uh, eventually and like dropping them in my repository, making them like a standard check that's gonna be run uh, when my CI is running uh, the, the, the linting. Um, and uh, definitely something I think would be super useful for uh, companies also to uh, define certain standards on their code bases. And uh, something that, that was uh, like freaking me out a lot is the local non-published crates kind of problem. Because um, initially the, the application was supposed to be published on crates.io uh, to be able to just install using cargo install. And um, that's all super nice, but the problem is you cannot depend on uh, like uh, like like crates that are not on crates IO, which means I couldn't even split up my project in my own repository into certain like into sub crates, which of course I did already when I found that out. So uh, it turns out that's that you that's uh, also a reason why crates IO is flooded with those tiny libraries sometimes because you are forced to do that, right? And a different problem that uh, is connected to that is uh, if, uh, if I had a situation where I had to fork a, like a repository, like a crate that I'm relying on, same problem, right? I cannot temporarily embed it or something and, and, and use it. I really have to, um, I would have to uh, republish it actually under a different name or try to get uh, to, the, to the maintainer to uh, take, accept my patch or whatnot. But last but not least, the, the biggest thing for me is, uh, I guess, a legacy from my D uh, time, which is metaprogramming. And that's something um, that, I, uh, that I really found lacking. Um, like I feel uh, the lack of, uh, of option and that sort of stuff. Now that I know it from Rust everywhere else, this is something I'm, I'm uh, missing in Rust from the D times. So what I mean by that is, um, for example, Implicit co compile time function execution. I, I really uh, am worried that this uh, approach that Rust is taking now to have uh, that you have to annotate your function with const uh, to be able to run it at compile time is, is this C++ approach with a const expert, uh, which I think uh, is the wrong way to go because in the end, the compiler is the guy who's uh, possible, who is capable of checking that uh, for me, right? So uh, why can't I um, 
uh, rely on that instead of annotating everything. And um, generic duct typing is something I'm, I'm really missing. I have to, uh, on generic functions, I have to uh, define what kind of T it is that I'm accepting here. I cannot just, uh, you know, use a t.foo because uh, I want the compiler to make sure t has a foo function. Um, I really have to come up with an impl trait, uh, uh, with the trait, and um, that's something I think uh, is limiting, especially when working with external libraries where you have external traits. There are situations where you cannot implement a trait for something uh, or where you just want to be able to accept also types uh, from external libraries like that. Um, <clears throat> And uh, compile time reflection is something that's, that's I think, the biggest strength uh, D ever has uh, had. And I really encourage uh, people to look into it because I think it's something that uh, I didn't see in any other language so far. And one example that I uh, just tried to like, like pseudocode uh, style of wanted to tr uh, like translate into Rust is this is int function where in D you have this static if, where you actually can introspect into types at compile time and uh, make sure that this is evaluated like only if the T uh, can be reduced to an I32, for example. But of course it gets, it, it, it goes way more complex and you can do way more things like looking into it. Uh, something that would, would be a parallel in Rust could be that you could say, okay, static if this is implementing a certain trait or something like that and then have different code actually uh, injected in, in this generic function. And uh, where I was missing this uh, the most was when I wrote my first macro, where I wanted to have these uh, components, like accessors to these components uh, for my UI layer, um, where I wanted to only maintain one list of components instead of having the risk that I forget to extend it in, in one end of the code base. So I wrote this accessor uh, macro that then actually generates those two uh, accessor uh, functions. And uh, while doing that, I was thinking, okay, uh, it would be super nice now if I could, while going through this list and implementing those accessors, actually like check on the, uh, on, the, on the types and see, okay, this is implementing a certain trait. So I do some additional work uh, for that. And that would be super like, like nice um, in my opinion. Ooh, I really tried to run through here. <laughs> uh, so yeah, thank you actually. This was uh, it. Okay, thank you. You wanna wake? Ah, yeah. This was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this was super, super interesting. Thank you for your talk. Um, we have maybe a few comments, not a cr like a real question. Um, one in the Zoom chat is, are you talking about using local non-published grades while doing development or are you talking about publishing binaries that, de de that depend on unpublished grades? Because you can do the former easily with cargo patch sections. Uh, okay. So I was actually talking about having a sub crate in my repository directly and relying on that. And that's, uh, I couldn't figure out how to do that. Patch sections, okay. That's something I need to look at. Yeah, up. like, I mean, you can basically override the path, which like in your dependency and can use like a, yeah, like a local path or a, like your own Git path, even like a branch, well. like an, un even like an unpublished branch. Okay. So, yeah, definitely yeah. a good point. I need to look into that. Path section. Oh yeah. Um, okay. I think there are no more questions, but like the talk was very detailed. Um, well, was good. Um, yeah. Thank you for your talk. Um, if you have other questions for the speaker, feel free to chat via metrics or Zoom contact. Um, we have a few more announcements. Um, this wasn't the last Rusty thing this week. There is a, like a London Rust meetup happening tomorrow. And on Thursday is our famous Hack and Learn, um, which would be happen in Berlin, but I assume this is also online. Um, yeah, um, great. Thank you for joining. If anyone has any comments, 
Thank you for all the technical help. Thank you all the speakers, everyone who's joined. If anyone wants to comment or give a note, I had a great time. <laughs> Me too. Okay. Us too. Thanks so much, Bastian. Welcome. The whole thing. <laughs> yeah, I had a great time as well. Cheers. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. Then we then I see you tomorrow at the Rust London meetup and on Thursday at the Berlin or online hack and learn. Thank you very much and see you next month. Bye.